Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our first webinar uh, from the series of three webinars uh, covering Central Europe's uh, issues from security to cooperation. My name is Tomasz Stępniewski. I'm a deputy director at the Institute of Central Europe uh, and also associated professor at the Catholic University of Lublin. The title of the webinar is Poland as a Stabilizer of European Security in the Eastern Dimension, uh, OSC Presidency and NATO after Madrid. Uh, this webinar is organized uh, uh, within the grant entitled Balkan Ambitions and Polish Inspirations, which is the public uh, task financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland within the grant competition Public Diplomacy uh, 2020. This grant uh, uh, contractor is the Center for Europe, University of Warsaw. The main institutional partners of this grant are Center for International Relations, Poland, Institute of Central Europe, Poland, St. Clement Ochrytski University, Bitola, from North Macedonia, University of uh, Cyril and Methodius, Skopje, University of Montenegro, University of Nish, Serbia, Institute for Research and uh, European Studies, North Macedonia, University of Gdańsk, Poland, University of Economics in Katowice, Poland, Polish uh, European Community Studies Associ Association, PEXA. Uh, the panelists of the web webinar uh, are uh, Mr. Dominik Jankowski is a political advisor and uh, head of uh, political section at the permanent delegation of Republic of Poland to NATO. And he's also the fellow uh, with the Harvard University in the program Arm Arms Control Negotiation Academy, ACONA. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Jakub uh, Bornio, Assistant Professor at the Department of European Studies, uh, University of Wrocław. Hello. And Dr. Damian Szacawa uh, from the Institute of Central Europe, uh, from Baltics Department, and also Assistant Professor at the Institute of Political Science and Public uh, Administration at uh, Maria Curie Skłodowska University. And uh, we will hold two rounds of questions uh, for our uh, panelists. Uh, so let's uh, begin with the uh, a question for Dominik Jankowski uh, regarding the outcome of the NATO summit in Madrid. What is your view of the NATO summit in uh, Madrid? Uh, was it a breakthrough event uh, or uh, was your view of NATO uh, in Madrid? And uh, are decisions made during the summit uh, are significant uh, for Poland and for the region, I mean, for Central and Eastern European countries? What is the significance of the summit for Ukraine uh, involved in the war with Russia? So, uh, Dominic, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tomas, and good morning um, to everyone. Uh, many thanks for the invitation uh, to this webinar. The, uh, the, the, the NATO summit in, in Madrid was, in fact, a, a crucial moment in, in, the, in the NATO decision-making processes in the last month. Um, and th there are several uh, key decisions that were taken, um, which are, in fact, boosting the, um, um, the deterrence and defense posture on NATO's eastern flank, but also, in fact, making sure that NATO is prepared for a long-term competition with uh, both Russia and China. So let me start with, with the most kind of visible outcome of the summit, which is the strategy concept, a first document of this kind since uh, 2010. And so uh, after a decade, we have finally a guiding document, political document, which is showing basically um, how NATO should be adapting in the next decade. There are, I would say there are three elements important from Polish and, and Eastern flag perspective. The first one is a very clear description of Russia as a threat. Um, and contrary to the document um, uh, adopted in 2010, which depicted Russia as a partner, there, there is a very clear, um, clear cut statement that Russia cannot be treated as partner and Russia is a direct threat to NATO allies. Um, th this is, in fact, a game changer because, uh, and this depicts reality, something that we have been saying for a few years that, that Russia um, uh, is, is challenging and threatening uh, different elements of the system. Um, but, but it is important because it, it's, it's a very clear, uh, also public political statement of how we are going to approach Russia in, in the years to come. That's one. Second, a, 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 a also clear decisions were communicated in the strategic concept with regards to the NATO presence on the eastern flank and how this presence will be evolving. 
I think we have finally moved from the concept of deterrence um, by punishment only to deterrence by denial and by punishment at the same time, which basically means that we'll be looking at more um, troops, allied troops on, on NATO Eastern flank in the years to come. They will be deployed um, within the enhanced forward presence. Um, this is because we will be implementing the so-called forward defense concept. This is a concept coming from Cold War, which basically means that the troops deployed on the Eastern flank will be combat ready and, and able to fight from day one, something that uh, Poland, the Baltic states uh, were uh, advocating for uh, for some time. So uh, we are extremely happy to see that reflected in the strategic concept. My final point here is, of course, uh, open door policy um, and uh, and very clear commitment that uh, both uh, um, Ukraine and Georgia will uh, become members of this alliance, um, even in this very difficult moment for both countries for different reasons. And um, I think this is a, a clear commitment on our side that uh, we want to um, uh, implement the decisions already taken in Bucharest in 2008. Um, and, and let me add one thing, because you've asked so much also about Ukraine. I think it's important to underline that that Ukraine was, in, in different shapes and forms, a, a key element of decisions uh, taken at the summit. One of the most practical ones, something maybe not that visible and, and probably, of course, cannot be compared to, um, uh, to military help provided by uh, allies uh, on a daily basis to Ukraine. Um, and is a, a NATO um, comprehensive assistance package um, to Ukraine, which we adopted in Madrid, um, which will be a, a boosted package uh, to the one that currently exists, which in fact has very clear commitment uh, on the NATO side that NATO will stay engaged in supporting Ukraine in the long term. Uh, through at least three elements. Let me mention them very briefly for your awareness. One is interoperability, so basically training of the Ukrainian armed forces, something which is crucial I mean, Providing equipment is one thing. Training troops uh, to operate that equipment is second thing. Second element is a commitment to reconstructing military infrastructure um, in, in Ukraine, of course, when the conditions permit to do it, uh, but, but I think it's a very clear goal. And third element is that uh, we will be looking at potentially opening a, a, a joint NATO Ukraine um, training and exercises center um, uh, at, at the time being on, on allied territory, but, uh, but who knows what's going to happen in the future. I think also a very clear commitment of, of uh, cooperation between, uh, between those two. Um, I'll stop here, but happy to dwell on, on the NATO summit in the second round. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dominique, for your insight uh, input uh, from, uh, let's say, a NATO perspective from Brussels. And uh, now it's a question for Jakub Borneo. So uh, what is your assessment of the security of uh, countries composing NATO's eastern flank uh, in view of the armed conflict uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine? Do you believe uh, we are witnessing a change uh, in international world order uh, in this part of Europe, or it is too early to, to make uh, this kind of uh, assessment of this affair, of the affairs? And the war uh, in Ukraine is ongoing. So what are the prospects for the uh, secession of hostilities? Uh, what, what, what's your perspective on this uh, uh, issue? So the floor is yours, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, so many issues to be covered. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tomasz, uh, for, uh, for having me here, especially among such a great um, panelists. Um, let, let me start my answer to your uh, question with a very simple, but at the same time, essential assumption that NATO is a proxy war with Russia uh, on the Ukrainian territory. And what's more, this structural rivalry uh, between uh, NATO and the US in particular and the Russian Federation, uh, you know, dates back at least uh, 20, uh, 2014. And from the Russian perspective, uh, it, uh, it lasts for a few years uh, longer, you know, especially if we recall the, the narrative of the so-called color revolutions, uh, the uh, famous uh, or infamous uh, Putin's Muni speech uh, 2007 or the August war in Georgia 2008. 
uh, not to mention Crimean annexation and hybrid warfare in uh, in Eastern uh, Ukraine that were, uh, I think, true game changers for the uh, Russian Western uh, relations. And having said that, uh, there's no doubt that uh, one should pay particular attention to uh, the so-called NATO's Eastern uh, flank. And, and the reason is very simple because uh, this, uh, these are NATO frontiers. Uh, these are uh, countries that have a direct or indirect border uh, with the uh, Russian uh, Federation and with Ukraine with all of its uh, consequences. Uh, these are countries that shoulder a substantial part of uh, NATO's responsibility for the security um, in the region. Um, and uh, most importantly, these are countries that are exposed the most to the Russian uh, interference. So, uh, you know, if the conflict between NATO and Russia uh, escalates, these are NATO frontiers that uh, are the most uh, endangered. Uh, but there's obviously this, you know, big if in this uh, in, in this uh, sentence, and I have serious doubts whether Russia is able to do so in the most uh, foreseeable uh, future and in in the current circumstances. Uh, but you know, uh, as a former uh, commander of multinational corp Northeast, uh, General Sławomir Wojciechowski once told me, one percent of probability is still the probability. So uh, there is no reason why NATO should NATO should uh, you know resign should stop building up its uh, military potential, especially in countries like Estonia, uh, Latvia, and uh, Lithuania, which are exposed uh, the most to the, uh, to the Russian uh, threat. But you know this is a topic for uh, for um, you know separate uh, debate. Now referring uh, to the impact of the. Uh, Russo-Ukrainian war, or to be more precise, uh, impact of the most uh, recent escalation of the conflict, because war has been there since 2014, on the security of NATO's uh, eastern flank, uh, the consequences are twofold, uh, I, I, I would say. Uh, of course, we need to bear in mind that security is a very multidimensional phenomenon, but I will refer right now only to this political and military branch of, uh, of, um, of security. And, uh, you know, undeniably, Russian aggression triggered some changes in the security of Central uh, and uh, Eastern uh, Europe. So as a result, we have uh, more uh, NATO troops on the ground uh, in the air at sea. Uh, we have new uh, security concept, which just been uh, presented, very briefly presented. Uh, we have the US breaking uh, the taboo of permanent deployment in the uh, post-Soviet uh, in the post-Soviet zone, and most importantly, we have uh, two new NATO uh, members very, very, very soon. So. Uh, as a result, you know, it did not play well for uh, for for Russia and for Putin himself, I think. Um, secondly, uh, it is very brutal what I'm going to say right now, but at the same time, it's it's very realistic uh, that uh, you know the more Russia is engaged in Ukraine, uh, the longer Ukrainian troops are repelling Russian army, and the, the more uh, assets and measures of uh, Russia are being damaged in Ukraine, the less likely Russia is to effectively threaten NATO, NATO's eastern flank. So that's the second consequence. And paradoxically, um, despite of, uh, you know, this uncertainty in, in the region, uh, this to increase security of NATO eastern frontiers. Uh, and, you know, this is quite simple for those uh, who are dealing with Russian foreign policy that you cannot easily appease Russia, okay? Um, one may negotiate uh, with Russia by all means, but uh, only from a, uh, position of, uh, from, from a position of strength. Uh, and, you know, of course, there are countries like Poland, Lithuania, and Romania that uh, always want more of, of NATO troops uh, on their soil. Uh, but we should uh, not forget that NATO is a collective alliance and um, much has been achieved uh, already. But on the other side, you know, on, on the other hand, uh, 
we should ask ourselves a question whether this uh, this uh, changes are permanent and here i come to your to the second part of uh, of uh, your question whether we have any kind of uh, new international order in the uh, in the region um, and you know obviously we need some time perspective to properly answer this question and to assess uh, this in a in a proper way and you know how academics are we uh, we uh, are very restrained when it comes to predictions uh, especially such large scale predictions or large format uh, predictions. But as I said before, undoubtedly there, there has been some security, uh, some changes in the architecture of, of, of security of a region, some uh, security paradigm uh, changes uh, also. Uh, but from my perspective, the most important is how, um, um, how for how long this changes uh, and this paradigm shift is going to uh, to to maintain you know and this is a question that we should ask um in the context of people's minds and especially political leaders uh, minds and especially those from uh, from uh, western uh, europe whether they are ready to maintain their course in the policy uh, toward uh, toward uh, russia you know um, but I also, you know, would like to emphasize that the, the real change uh, happened already in 2014, you know, because we have a qualitative change uh, back then. Uh, NATO for the first time openly declared that Russia is a threat to, to the alliance and by saying so uh, also the opponent uh, to, to, to the alliance. It established reassurance policy in uh, in the new port, then transferred it into deterrence policy uh, in uh, in Warsaw. You know, but also you know, just to be uh, a bit critical, we should not forget that NATO is uh, or used to be uh, reactive in their activities, uh, and I'm pretty sure that we all uh, know very famous tweet uh, by General Jam Ben Ben Hodges who say that. You know he was wrong uh, while saying that uh, that he was wrong and and then that NATO should have deployed permanent uh, troops uh, on NATO's eastern flag already few uh, few years ago. You know, uh, so so yeah, you know th these were my points and the last 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 issue that you raised. Uh, well, what are my predictions about uh, the war in uh, in Ukraine? Here again, we come to uh, to predictions, uh, which is very sensitive. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we know from the history of, uh, of the conflicts, you know, of the military conflicts is that the wars end only three ways. So uh, either one side achieves decisive victory or the other side achieves uh, decisive victory or there is an impasse. Uh, and, you know, the access to data, at least for me, are uh, still very limited. However, what we can observe and what one can observe right now uh, in Ukraine is that Russia hasn't achieved its, uh, its uh, goals and it's moving very slowly, but still uh, it's, it's moving, you know, um, and Ukraine is unable to carry out a uh, counterattack. A counterattack uh, right now is, uh, unfortunately, from NATO side. Uh, unable to uh, to retake uh, its land, so I say our listeners uh, may draw their own conclusion from uh, from that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jakub, for your assessment of the situation in in our region. I mean, uh, mostly uh, regarding to NATO system flank, and now a question uh, to um, Damian Szatzawa. So at present, uh, Poland holds uh, the chairmanship of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in uh, Europe. So what are Poland's objectives? Um, so that's the first question. And uh, are these realistic in view of Russia's war uh, in uh, with Ukraine? Is the OSCE as an organization responsible uh, for European secu security capable of making any changes as regard the conflict uh, in Ukraine. What's your uh, perspective on the on that uh, um, situation? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tomasz, for inviting. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for having me here within this uh, um, within this uh, th th this webinar. Um, 
So uh, let's let's think uh, about the OC because this is a quite interesting organization um, from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok, as uh, as as we can mention, because there is uh, uh, there are 57 member states, and um, Poland took over the OC chairmanship uh, at the beginning of January. It's a one-year uh, chairmanship. Uh, of course, uh, our priorities uh, were created uh, at, in the second uh, half of 2021. So it was a completely different uh, environmental situation, uh, security situation, uh, in especially in this in this region. And uh, of course, uh, the main objective of the Polish chairmanship uh, is um, is connected with. Uh, uh, regional and frozen conflict, and uh, Poland uh, try to um, try to solve this uh, uh, these problems, these conflicts. Um, try to um, put special attention to promoting comprehensive assistance to conflict affected populations. So it was the first uh, and the first uh, the first um, um, pro um, the, the the first objective. Then uh, we have the second one, uh, which was responding to post-COVID challenges in the EOC, uh, mainly through effective multilateralism, mainly cooperation with uh, uh, civil society uh, actors, with NGOs and other organizations. And finally, uh, the, third, uh, the third objective was to um, fully utilizing the EOC's potential by working in a spirit of cooperation to implement uh, shared commitments uh, made by all member states and uh, and 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 your second question um is quite uh, quite difficult um, uh, for for the organization itself um, because you know it takes two to tango uh, and in case of doc it takes uh, 57 to reach a compromise um, actually, uh, 56 because uh, there is uh, this uh, this rule consensus minus one. Yeah, so the OCE is uh, an organization based on a consensus, and we have seen many times how difficult for international organizations, not only for the OCE but also for the United Nations, for the Security Council, but also in case of NATO enlargement, we saw uh, Turkish veto to uh, NATO enlargement to Sweden and 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 and, and Finland. Yeah, so uh, we have seen many times how difficult for uh, international organizations is to punish their members that violated international law. Um, so maybe maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I remember only once uh, when this uh, consensus minus one exception in the OC was uh, uh, was introduced. Introduced. It was in 1992 uh, in regarding to Yugoslavia, to Serbia, Serbia and uh, and Montenegro. Then, so this reflects how difficult it is to isolate a single country in a decision-making process, uh, as countries are often able to find at least one ally. And uh, in case of Russia, uh, they 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 have a little bit more allies in case of the. OC. Uh, now it's a little bit changing, but still, Russia is uh, is able to block any decision uh, regarding um, conflict in Ukraine, regarding war in Ukraine, uh, which could be, um, let's say, um, which could be uh, done by the OC. So even if uh, even if uh, other uh, member states of the OC will decide to uh, suspend Russia, for example. A number of other questions uh, have appeared. For example, is it uh, is it able? Yeah? Because in case of many international organizations, um, uh, when we have one member state that uh, violate international law, um, well, probably one of the um, the only one and uh, the, the only one uh, way to punish it is uh, naming and uh, naming and shaming strategy. Um, yeah, we, of course we could we could we could suspend, but uh, but it's uh, it's not resolve any any question. And uh, in case of uh, in case of um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, we uh, saw that uh, our that, that Poland's uh, foreign minister uh, Zbigniew Rau uh, have visited uh, a few times uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, even before uh, before the war. 
um, started at the end of February, on the 24th of February. Actually, if I remember correctly, one week before uh, Minister Rao uh, paid a visit to, to Moscow and discuss uh, with uh, Minister Lavrov about the situation on, on Ukraine and so on and so on. And, and uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to, to think that this organization is effective and, uh, and could be effective, especially if the special monitoring mission uh, of the OC uh, in, in Ukraine uh, was ceased to exist because Russia didn't agree to uh, prolong its, its, uh, its mandate. Yeah, so, so it's uh, um, it, it's um, so so this is uh, one thing, um, and uh, and there is also one another question. Um, I, I talk at the beginning about the objectives, about programs, about plans. Yeah, and and there is always a question: How can we turn plans, programs into reality? Um, the OCE duty adapted system of consensus decision making is an example of international organizations whose effectiveness results directly from the existence of consensus among all the member states. It's not only uh, the, let's say, challenge behind Polish, Poland, Polish chair, chairmanship, but it's also, it was also a challenge behind previous chair, chairmanships, uh, including Sweden, for example, in 2021, uh, or including Albania in 2020. So, Due to the numerous conflicts between the OC member states, many decisions are not adopted or are delayed. Yeah? As a result, no solutions have been found for any of the security challenges in the OC area uh, that had existed for the, for, for, for the next uh, uh, two or three decades. Yeah? I, I've mean, uh, of course, Ukraine, but there is also Belarus, there is a Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict and so on and so on. Transnistria. So, uh, so uh, this, uh, th this means that all important decisions uh, that should be adapted at the ministerial council are not adapted. And this, this organization is blocked. So, uh, so I could say at the end uh, that uh, the risk of the OC uh, to become a dysfunctional organization is growing. Uh, and, uh, and finally, let me, let me conclude that uh, um, I wholly maintain my conclusion from the end of 2021 that the OC is an hostage to the deteriorating international situation in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Damian, uh, uh, for your uh, comments on the uh, Polish uh, chairmanship uh, at OSC, but also on the situation in this organization. And uh, now uh, it's a time for a second round of questions uh, to our uh, panelists. And a uh, question for Dominik Jankowski. Uh, so how the countries of Western Europe uh, view the uh, uh, summit in um, NATO summit in Madrid? Uh, are they ready for a change of approach to Russia uh, and a change in the perception of uh, Russia as a threat to European security? You mentioned about it, uh, but, but uh, I'm interested in this uh, issue. And uh, let us uh, talk about the uh, real I mean, uh, tangible changes and not only declarations. So do you see any real uh, let's say, change in the perspective of Russia. So the floor is yours, Dominique. We agreed jointly that Russia is a threat. So I, I, you know, I believe this is, this is the first step in the right direction. Every single NATO uh, ally um, subscribed to that assessment. Does it mean that every single NATO ally has the same perception of every, every tiny element of how Russia is functioning and what we can expect? Back then, in, in the future, no, of course not. I, I think the um, the perceptions um, they they still differ. Um, but it was, I mean, let me say like this: it was reassuring for a lot of us, and for me personally, to see how swiftly the West, collective West, responded to to the war after um, after the um, the invasion on twenty fourth of February both in terms of sanctions, but also in terms of deployments uh, to NATO Eastern flank, um, additional deployments uh, about those that uh, have already existed. Um, are, are we, the, the question, the real question is, are we ready for that long-term uh, competition with, with Russia? Um, because this is a strategic competition where 
I think Mr. Warner said that we are in a proxy war. That's true, that, that, that there, there is a proxy war happening. I, I have been saying for some time that we have been as allies in a direct conflict with Russia in cyberspace, in information space, and in, 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 in other domains, let's put it like that, which, which is, of course, not meaning threshold of an open war. But, but still is, is very clearly putting us um, on, a, on a threat list of the Russian Federation. I believe that we have, we have seen change in some NATO allies over the last few months. Um, and, and this is a good change, change which brings more realism to the assessment of Russia. Um, change with, which also brings very clear decision in terms of supporting Ukraine. Once again, we can blame and shame some of those who are doing that um, in a slower pace, um, um, and, and rightly so. I think we need to exercise pressure on those allies who are still not providing adequately um, uh, weapons um, uh, to Ukraine, uh, be it be it Germany, uh, be it to some extent France. But my, my point is, I don't currently see how we could come back to what was previously described as business as usual um, with the Russian Federation, also because I think no single current decision maker in Western Europe would be ready um, to openly enter a, um, a cooperation uh, scheme with, um, with President Putin, who is a war criminal. Um, and, 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 I, and I think the number of you know, changing elements that patterns that we have seen in Ukraine, including war crimes, um, is, is something that, that was and is an eye opener for, um, for a lot of Western countries. That brings me to my final point here. I, I think we need to be prepared um, to exercise and maintain pressure on Russia for years to come. And I think this will be the crucial element uh, where we need to do much more. First of all, we, we need to continue to explain on our, to our publics why we are doing so and why the price um, is higher than it was. I mean, the costs are rising, daily costs of our lives are rising. And th this is something that every single NATO member, every single EU member will have to do on its own. Um, because without, you know, uh, public opinion support, it will be very difficult to maintain a coherent stance against Russia in the years to come. My second point all is that we need to continue to provide a, a military equipment um, to Ukraine. And, and I think, of course, we are already seeing some shortages on, on the European side, where suddenly some allies are discovering they do not, do not have enough even for their own armed forces. But it doesn't mean that, you know, um, properly planning how we are going to support Ukraine in a military terms over the next months is something that we have already started. I think we can execute that much faster um, in, a, in a coherent fashion. Final element is keeping the US in Europe. Um, in a, because of course, I haven't mentioned that in my first intervention, but there is a new factor in the new strategic concept. China, for the first time, um, has been mentioned in the document. And this one of the, let's say, important elements for a lot of allies as a point of reference uh, for um, the future um, engagement um, around the globe. So NATO, as our Secretary General is saying, China, we, we, are not, we, are, we are not bordering China, but China is approaching us every single day faster and faster. So it, having that in mind, I do believe that we need to make sure that the US remain committed um, on the European continent, be it on, in, 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 in the military sphere, economic sphere, technological sphere, um, this is a, also a long-term project for us Europeans uh, to, to make sure that the, the, US, uh, the, the West, the so-called um, um, like-minded West, is united um, in a long-term response uh, to the Russian threat. Over to you, Tomasz. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, uh, for your uh, brief comments. And uh, you are right that uh, not only Russia is a threat uh, for NATO, but uh, China is uh, rising as a kind of uh, real threat in the nearest uh, future. But uh, uh, hopefully we organize an, another uh, seminar uh, on, on China's uh, influences in, in, in our region. But uh, now it's a uh, uh, question for um, Damian Shatsava. And my question uh, is regarding to Finland's and Sweden's accession to NATO. 
so to what extent uh, can these countries affect the security situation in the uh, Baltic Sea region and to what extent NATO's expansion will uh, merely translate into a longer NATO border to be defended and uh, had it not been for the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, these countries wouldn't become mobilized to join NATO. So was the security so strongly affected uh, by their recent affairs? What's your opinion? So, Damian, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tomasz. And uh, I would like to refer a little bit to what uh, Dominik Jankowski said, said, said in, in his uh, previous speech about the open door policy of uh, of nato and uh, regarding thomas your last question um, both states i mean finland and sweden perceived this uh, um, this possibility to join nato as one of guarantees of their national security strategies and uh, when president putin um, asked let's say uh, in the in, in the mid of december um, European leaders to um, to rewrite um, and sorry secu regional security architecture in Europe, and to uh, move back NATO troops to 1997. Both countries uh, perceive this as a as a direct threat uh, to the to their NATO option. Um, in case of Finland, it was uh, the, the NATO option uh, is uh, well one of the um, one of the um, main um, was actually or was uh, one of the main um, stepping stones in international security. In case of Sweden, the situation was a little bit uh, a little bit different. Yeah, so so this is uh, th this is the reason. I perceive um, this uh, um, decision in Madrid uh, in, in Madrid summit as a historically significant for the Baltic Sea region because on the one hand we see, uh, the promise uh, to enhance the alliance collective defense capabilities in the in the region the baltic states but also um, this summit decided to officially invite finland and sweden of course uh, this is the next stage of the nato enlargement in response to the application submitted in a coordinated way by these two countries in the mid of may 2020 um, as i said before it was uh, Possible uh, because uh, of uh, the agreement of uh, the agreement with with Turkey, uh, which had blocked the move until the last uh, minute, uh, and and so on and so on. So we 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 are in a, another part. Um, so so secondly, uh, we think I, I I think that we observe a strong NATOization of the Baltic Sea region as uh, as as. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, NATO said, "Yeah, that, that's uh, this is another example of Putin's success. Yeah, because uh, uh, his intention was to Finlandize Ukraine, but he received uh, NATOization of Finland. I I will refer that it's rather NATOization of uh, of the whole Baltic region, and." Uh, Apart from a symbolic change in the regional security architecture, the enlargement of NATO to include Sweden and Finland will also have practical significance. On a political level, security policies of uh, both states will in many places be in line with uh, our security policy, uh, with security policy of Baltic Sea states, uh, especially in terms of uh, identical perception of threats coming from Russia. What Dominik Jankowski said, uh, we, we agree that Russia is, uh, uh, is our enemy, actually, enemy number, num number one. Uh, and uh, the, secondly, uh, they also agree with strengthening uh, of NATO's eastern flank. Um, I think that we can treat uh, this uh, uh, Finland uh, border with Russia, which is uh, more than 1,300 kilometers, as an extension of uh, NATO's eastern flank. Very important extension. Very important from, especially from the uh, point of view of the Baltic Sea states. So, at the strategic level, uh, it will ensure better control over the sea lanes in the Baltic Sea. Uh, because of, um, of, of islands like Gotland, but also board, um, uh, sorry, the Island Islands and so on and so on. And this will help um, 
th this will increase our ability to assist the Baltic states in the event of possible aggression on their territory. So uh, after NATO enlargement, it will be possible by land, by sea and air. Uh, with Finland and Sweden joining NATO, the geostrategic situation in the Baltic Sea region will change. The alliance forces will gain additional operational depth in terms of the eastern direction and the border with Russia. And finally, and at the operational level, uh, the ability of both countries, uh, of Finland and Sweden, to defend their territory and contribute to the development of NATO's collective forces will strengthen the regional capacity of the uh, NATO. Um, I think that I've, I, I perceive that uh, this decision to um, include Sweden and, and, and Finland in NATO is a game changer for the Baltic Sea region, for the security in the Baltic Sea region, because this decision will mean also a change in the deployment of Russian forces. Because we are talking about strategic areas from Russia's point of view. Uh, because uh, of the St. Petersburg, which is the second largest city in Russia. Uh, we have uh, the Primorsk terminal, which is also very important for Russia for its oil exports. And, uh, and, and now we are talking about uh, NATO's closeness to the strategic base of the Arctic fleet in Murmansk, uh, in a port that doesn't freeze. So we remember what is the importance of um, Russia's submarine fleets, uh, this, this um, Arctic fleet. Um, so, um, so, 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 from my point of view, and to to to, to finish, uh, this will be a game changer. And uh, well, but but on the other hand, uh, we cannot uh, let's say um, we cannot uh, forget uh, that uh, uh, that the Baltic Sea region is also uh, a key area. This is a crucial area for our energy security uh, because of uh, diversification, because of uh, green energy. Uh, but it also it, it means that uh, it means that uh, we that there should be no illusion uh, that uh, we can we as a Poland can give up on strengthening our navy because Finland and, and Sweden will join NATO. We should remember about that and we should modernize our our, our fleet. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Damian, uh, uh, for your comments on not only security, uh, 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 but also on energy um, issues. So it's uh, it's right now a crucial uh, uh, factor. And uh, Jakub Bornio, uh, can you comment uh, on changes regarding Germany's, uh, Germany's Eastern policy? To what, to what extent uh, does it mean uh, mere declarations? Uh, to what extent uh, is it a um, valid assessment of the situation? And to what extent does it mean, uh, uh, does it uh, aim at maintaining the status quo in Eastern Europe? So what's your view of uh, Olaf Scholz's uh, attitude towards uh, Ukraine? So the floor is your, Jakub. Thank you. Uh, that's a tough question, Tomasz, you know, and uh, being honest with you, I'm thinking about it constantly since the war restarted and I have no clue how to properly answer this question. But uh, even though I will try to give some of my, uh, you know, comments and insights uh, on that. Uh, but, but before uh, we, uh, we discuss, uh, you know, uh, German's policy and German stance, stance on most recent events in Ukraine, uh, we should understand, uh, you know, nature of German Eastern policy, the so-called Ost, uh, Ostpolitik. And, uh, you know, unlike, unlike uh, the Polish Eastern policy that pays particular attention to uh, the so-called in-between states like Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, Belarus, or even Moldova, uh, German Ostpolitik made Russia its main focal, and, uh, main focal point and main point of uh, reference. And, uh, you know, uh, if one says that German Ostpolitik was based on Russia, uh, Russia first principle, uh, that wouldn't be an uh, exaggeration. Uh, you know, that is why I was very skeptical when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, Ukraine's uh, under President Poroshenko policy uh, to to solve um, to, to solve the conflict by putting all its eggs into German uh, German basket, because 
you know, after all, after 2014, Germany was uh, very uh, restrained when it comes to further militarization of NATO's uh, eastern eastern flank, and it did not only put, uh, you know, uh, it did not only express it verbally. Uh, but also by concrete uh, activities. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, it happened that Germany um, didn't grant authorization for the U.S. troops' uh, right across its uh, its territory. It also effectively vetoed uh, the alliance status for the Anaconda 16 drills that happened uh, largely in in Poland. Uh, and most importantly, it was developing uh, its infrastructure energy projects with uh, with Russia. You know, um, yet still after uh, February twenty fourth, um, German policy uh, you know remained ambiguous. On one hand, uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, rapidly announced a kind of a shift in German foreign and security uh, policy with. Uh, deep uh, restructurization of and uh, great investments in Bundeswehr. Um, it, it included also some military supplies to, uh, to Ukraine uh, and uh, some great reforms in the structure of natural resources imports. Uh, so these were the cause of this, uh, of this uh, shift. But on the other hand, we are still waiting for the effects of this, uh, of this uh, announcements, you know. So eventually, uh, Germany provided Ukraine with uh, heavy weaponry, uh, namely the self-propelled uh, uh, holsters, uh, only in late, uh, late June. Um, and there are some signals that Germany uh, may block uh, further transfers, further delivery of, uh, Leopard, uh, of Spanish Leopards uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, bearing in mind, uh, you know, given their history, uh, their uh, geopolitical interests, uh, I, I totally understand Germans' uh, position and I do not blame them uh, at all. But at the same time, they certainly have some problem with image. Uh, so, you know, it, it's quite, it's a kind of mystery for me, you know, it remains uh, not, it's not really clear for me uh, what are Germany's true intentions and what is true nature of this shift that has been announced, you know, already a few, uh, few uh, years, so, sorry, few, few, few months ago. Uh, we should ask ourselves a question, how to read uh, Germans engagement and how to uh, understand uh, this, even these deliveries to and, and military supplies to Ukraine. Uh, we should ask ourselves what if they are not caused by goodwill or real shift, but rather they are caused by international rather than domestic pressure uh, that, that has been put on, uh, on Germany. So, uh, so, you know, instead of uh, giving you some answers, I only raise several other questions, uh, but I truly believe that sometimes it's wiser to you know, ask proper questions than, than uh, give you uh, incorrect or inaccurate answers. So yeah, that was my, my comment. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Jakob. And you are right that uh, there are more questions than answers, but uh, uh, the conflict is ongoing. So that's really important to support Ukraine because it's uh, in our um, uh, interest also. So, uh, you know, so it was the, the last round of, of questions. So I would like to extend a warm uh, thanks uh, to our uh, panelists uh, for sharing their views with us. Uh, I do hope that uh, we will have soon uh, another uh, opportunity to continue our discussions uh, on Central European countries on issues uh, connected with uh, security and also cooperation. And uh, also I would like to thank the main institutional partners of the uh, grant. Uh, thank you very much and uh, see you. So goodbye. <laughs>